right, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm assuming everybody is a veteran by now. Any first timers to this lecture series? A couple. Ah, okay. Well, we saved the best for last. Um, I, I will tell you, if you missed the first four, they're all online. In fact, I watched the one from last week, last night myself. I was not here. So, what would everybody think of Matt and Kara? Did they do a good job last week? Yeah, I enjoy that. Good. I'll, I'll tell them you said so. Um, so we've done the history, the 100 year look back, and the review of aeronautics, and the review of science, and the review of space exploration. So we thought it would be appropriate to take a, a long look forward and try and predict the next 100 years of Langley and NASA. And we've got a great group here today to help do that for you. Um, Jean-Francois Bartholomé, who I'm gonna introduce here in just a second, is our center chief technologist. And, and it is his job to look at really the future and technology needs for future exploration and aeronautic systems and to help influence the research and the development we do at NASA and particularly at Langley. And we've got a group from our systems analysis and advanced concepts group who are gonna share with you their vision of the future. And they're the people that are actually gonna make it happen. You'll see they're, you're, they're a little younger than both Jean Francois and myself. That's sort of been the theme here all, all month. We brought in some of our uh, younger folks who really are the future of Langley. So hopefully you've enjoyed that. So without further ado, let me introduce to you Jean Francois Bartholomew, and he's going to kick this off. Thanks. Thank you. So good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here. We've been looking forward to this presentation for quite a few weeks now. Uh, you've heard about our history, about what we've done in aeronautics, in space, in science. And now we're going to open the door and look beyond what hopefully you've heard so far. We're going to be looking into the future, and I invite you, I welcome you on this trip with us. So why do we do this? We, we have essentially three reasons. The first one is we want to be ready for the future. We want to have the people in place. We want to have the ideas. We want to have the infrastructure that we need to be able to uh, move in the future. The second is that uh, we want to, the uh, future is ahead of us, so we have a chance to control it. And so this is a time for us to try and anticipate and, and steer it in a direction that we think is, is going to be profitable for all of us. And then finally, and perhaps the reason we do that the most, is it's, it's a cause for inspiration. Uh, if you look at the pictures behind, you see an illustration of the Trappist set of planets, and uh, that's 40 light years away. And uh, you see also a picture of Kepler, that's 200 light years away. Not very likely that we're going to get there in our lifetime or even 100 years, but just thinking about what it would take to get there and how it would look like <laughs> inspires us and inspires younger generation to uh, innovation and creativity. Now, uh, why are we talking about 100 years? Well, I have a confidence to, 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 to share with you. Some of the ideas you're going to hear today may happen before 100 years. Some probably will not happen for a couple hundred years. But that helps us to think beyond the current program and where, where we're already committed to go. So having said that, today we're not going to be talking about science fiction. So there will be no holodeck and, and no warp drive. We're also going to stick to the current physics, what we understand of the current physics. That's not to say that we might learn something new about physics in the future. It's just that we're going to conform to what we know physics permit us to do. And then one thing we're not, not going to talk about is those major cataclysmic events, you know, like uh, uh, a major uh, melt of the ocean, a uh, major asteroid uh, impact, because really that would take a different conversation. So what you're going to hear about today is really the musings of a number of subject matter experts or possibly uh, uh, thought leader in the world of aerospace. And uh, some of those things are going to come to pass. Some are not going to come to pass. Some might make it into NASA programs, but we think they're all exciting. So here is what we are going to be talking about. Here is our outline. I will first share a few thoughts about trends that we think are going to have, be of impact in aerospace, whether it's for the government or private sector. And those were gathered 
in a, a set of workshops we ran earlier in the year with uh, uh, literally thought leaders. We'll bring them back later at the end of this program. And then after me, uh, I'm going to have Brandon Litterland, who is from our aeronautics systems and analysis branch, talk to us about transportation, mostly uh, transportation around the Earth, but he's going to branch out and think, uh, see how we go into, into space. After that, I'll have Dale Arney, who is from our uh, space mission analysis branch, and he's going to be talking about a number of missions that we could be conducting, and, and as you'll see, clearly those are way beyond the, the couple hundred years, the, the hundred years that, that we're thinking about. And then I'll have Hilary Blakely, who is from our mechanical systems engineering branch, who is going to be talking to us about NASA in the 22nd century. Now, so far, we will have spoken about technology. Now she's going to talk about and think about what does it mean to us as humans to, uh, to move in 100 years. There will be some fundamental changes. We're going to have to be prepared for those. And then I'll wrap up the presentation with closing comments from the folks who attended this workshop that I talked to you earlier. So let me start by identifying six trends that we, that we, that we uh, uh, singled out during our workshop earlier in the year. And you may have other trends that you think are going to be of impact. I just want to share the ones that for us were especially important. The first one has to, has to do with governance. It has to do with who are going to be the people who are going to be deciding about our future, and in particular, our future in aerospace. And it is clear that we are in a world that's, in, that's an undergoing globalization. And frankly, the genie has left the bottle. There is no going back from globalization. It's driven by economics. It's driven by business. It's driven by technology. However, as we've seen in recent political uh, 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 events, uh, there is clearly some, some, there are clearly some serious issues with those. And, and, and countries, not only in the United States, but, 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 but elsewhere, are also debating whether we, they want to maintain a centralized uh, uh, autonomy or whether they want to uh, go back to uh, what is nationalization or re regionalization. In addition to that, for decades now, we have moved away from representative government and we have given more and more opportunities to either individual or individual organization, opportunities for them to weigh in on major decisions. And for a good example in the U.S. is this notion of ballot initiative, where the states basically does not go to the representative, but goes straight to the people to help make decisions. Okay? And what this means is that we're going to be moving towards distributed governance. And what that means is that we're going to have decisions made globally, decision made locally, decision made uh, by sampling individual, decisions made by a uh, different organization, private sector. We're going to see many more players in the world, world of aerospace than we have had in the, in the past. It's probably going to mean that we're going to have less large tax-funded project, but what we will have more of is more partnership, partnership, international partnership, par partnership between the private and the public sector. And if you trace back what has happened in space, we actually went uh, to the moon essentially on, um, on the strength of tax U.S. taxpayers' investment. Uh, we have created a space station by inviting uh, uh, foreign contributors and eventually as we settled the station, actually we had, had more and more participation from the private sector, whether to go to the station and back or whether to uh, actually um, uh, demonstrate new technologies on board of the space station. As we are thinking about the next exploration of planets, whether it's the moon, Mars, or beyond that, we have already had a number of private sector organizations who have raised their hands and said, we want to be players. And in fact, let us show you how we will do that. And we have more and more international participants who are interested as well. Second topic of interest to uh, our folks is uh, what's going to happen to work? What's the uh, about the nature of work? And uh, there are studies that uh, have, uh, fairly recent studies that have indicated if you look at the next 20 to 60 years, we can expect that 50% of the job that we have right now will be automated. Now, in the world of aerospace, it's actually a little more than that. Uh, it's actually closer to 60%. And uh, what this means is we're going to have to rethink fundamentally the nature of work. There will be work that in the category that may be lower skill and certainly dangerous and repetitive work that we will definitely automate. There is work at the other end of the spectrum that we more than likely will not be able to automate. And somewhere in between, we will have work that we could automate and we will have the opportunity to choose whether or not we want to automate. And I would think that anything that has to do with creativity and innovation, we as humans are going to want to retain 
maintain a, a significant participation in that kind of work. But the point that is, this is making is that uh, we are moving to much more uh, human-machine collaboration, whether it's human and robots, human and computers, human and artificial intelligence. And, um, and, and you could think that you know, losing 50% of the current jobs to automation would have a significant impact on employment. And the report that I, that, that I was referring to actually makes an interesting point. It said that actually, no, in term, automation has actually over the years, uh, in some instances, increased the number of work. The key to that, though, is the training and the education necessary to take on the new technologies and be able to contribute in, in different ways. And this is why the whole notion of lifelong learning is critical. Third area that was obviously relevant to transportation is that of energy. The picture you see here gives you a sense that our energy consumption over long time has increased uh, the manière, uh, essentially exponentially. And that's because the consumption of energy is proportional to the size of the economy. And face it, the economy has, has been uh, increasing dramatically over the last two centuries. Now, you could think that we're going to get to a point where we're going to run out of, of, of fossil sources of energy, and that's possible. But more importantly, we are probably 10 to 20 years away from the time where it's going to be more economical to use energy generated by renewable means than it is to be using uh, fossil fuels. In other words, we're going to be driven by market reason to actually switch over to uh, electrical and alternative forms of energy. What this means, and you're going to have uh, quite an exposure to that in a presentation from Brandon, it, it, it means that we're going to have to look at a, a transportation system that's going to be dramatically different. In a nutshell, we're going to fly to many more areas than we're flying now, where we are used to driving. And in fact, it's actually, it may actually be meaningful to be moving heavy loads like cargo around. What it means is that the ground transportation system, the air transportation system were going to become much more integrated and um, and I, I think that it, it is going to change the, the transportation landscape. Another area that was important is that of artificial reality. We are about five to ten years away from having artificial reality uh, in routine use, although to, it will be at that point in very focused area and very limited area. We think that the private sector and the, the commercial application are going to drive development in artificial reality, but obviously they are going to have a significant impact on aerospace. Uh, from the standpoint of exploration, uh, what artificial reality is going to give us is a merging between the physical world that we can actually touch and the digital world, and so we're going to be able to, to uh, enhance the, ex the experience of exploration by uh, superimposing digital information generated by computer over what uh, the physical world, and that's going to make it quite a bit more productive. On the transportation side, it's going to raise an interesting question. Now that we can simulate other worlds uh, by virtual reality, do we still need transportation? And you can argue it both ways. Uh, the, the, the systems we're designing are becoming more and more complicated. It's inconceivable we can't do that without a serious dose of, of uh, machine control. Uh, but, but again, as, as I indicated before, the humans are going to want to remain in the system. And so we're going to have to work the human-machine interaction very closely. And in the, in the world of exploration, that may be the only solution that we have. There, there are some areas that it's inconceivable we'll ever reach. And, um, and, and so what we'll, uh, what we, that will have some implication on the research we do in that area. We're going to have to learn to deal with machines that are remote. And we're going to have to have some special requirements for safety, communication, autonomy, and reasoning because of the risk associated with human uh, and machine interacting in space. The last area uh, that I want to bring up is that of human augmentation. And uh, at the end of the day, my point is humans are going to want to be part of the experience, but in a sense, humans are going to be the weak link in the experience. And so we're going to have to prepare the humans to do that, whether it's by physical uh, or, or medical conditioning, body or mind enhancement, uh, and then synthetic biology. This is genetic world trying to change the human so that he or she will be resistant to the environment that they are going to have to, dis to, to, uh, to visit. We have some experience in that area, but there is still significant progress to be made. Big questions, are people going to accept doing that? And uh, are we going to want, at the end of the day, to send humans or robots? So those are the trends that we identified. So let me pass the, the baton now to uh, Brandon, who is going to be talking to us about the future of transportation. 
All right, thanks very much, and hi everybody. I'm Brandon Litherland, an aerospace engineer with the Aeronautic Systems Analysis Branch here at NASA Langley. So we'll go ahead and present some of the big questions that we look at, things like where are we going, how do we get there, and inevitably, are we there yet? Now to that last one, not quite, but we can look at some of the trends that we're observing and point us in the direction that we might want to go. So, population is what drives transportation demand. And a UN study showed that in the next 50 years, we can see a global population of about 11 billion people. That number is huge. So even with things like virtual reality and virtual presence, there's still going to be a much higher demand for getting from point A to point B. So much higher travel density, much more complicated travel networks, to the point that we need advanced computers or artificial intelligence to maintain these networks with human oversight. So things like autonomous operation of delivery vehicles and transportation systems or goods distribution across the country. You know, it could be that the demand for goods distribution is such that you print things in your home on a 3D printer with your own resources and get things immediately. Or routine delivery of things like groceries with an automated air vehicle. You know, we already see things like privatization of the space industry. We only expect that trend to continue even to the point of things like space tourism and uh, ships moving around in the Jovian bodies, for example. As JF mentioned, if we lose our dependence on fossil fuels and have this open landscape of energy that we can apply it in any number of creative ways, what does that mean and what does it look like? And we certainly expect to have a human presence on extraterrestrial bodies like Mars and the Moon and uh, places like that. So how do we maintain the transportation networks that keep those colonies and outposts going? So we have a graphic here that kind of represents a landscape of the future, starting with a city in the center and kind of moving out to suburbs and then off to the, uh, the offshore communities. So we see things like integrated transportation hubs and dense traffic restricted cities, offshore stations and distant suburban communities. So let's take a look closer to the center, like how, how do we get there, what does it look like? Well, an example of a dense traffic restricted city, if we have all of the traffic kind of moved out from the city center, where all of the people now don't necessarily need personal vehicles. You see all these, you know, small vehicles moving around in this concept of what we call on-demand mobility, which is this rising trend of sharing vehicles or having things by request rather than having a personal vehicle that sits and rests all day. And if that's the case, then in dense cities, down on the ground where there aren't any more cars, you have this open area where pedestrians and bicycles and pathways and things can operate to where the individual person can move much more efficiently across the city. And then uh, perhaps, you know, a better automated metro system or even uh, public transportation in levels as you go higher and higher in an air vehicle. Advancements in material concepts where you start building, be making buildings taller and taller, you open up these vertical travel lanes to where you can ease the congestion upward instead of packing everything down on the ground. So this kind of creates this really complex interdependence between suburban areas where it's entertainment and it's work and it's leisure and it's, you know, the necessities and then everything kind of ties into each other. So let's move a little bit farther out and kind of observe this concept of a high-speed rail or a high-speed loop surrounding the city and kind of interconnecting all of these exterior areas like a transportation center or a distribution hub or even to the point of inter interconnecting these urban areas. Now, these could be an alternative to supersonic flight or raw material distribution, um, but based on what it would take to actually build a national network of high-speed rail, the infrastructure alone is just kind of cost prohibitive. You would have to build the thing from scratch. So uh, it may be better to just make advancements in aeronautics to where you can use these large-scale vehicles to transfer freight and goods and materials across the country. Because one, it's less prone to attack. Two, you can get from point A to point B rather easily. And as the aeronautics advance, it becomes more and more efficient and affordable to do it that way. So let's take a look at some of the transportation hubs. Now, some airports and cities already have this started. You know, Metro interconnects with the airport, and then you can go from your house to the metro to the airport to where you need to go without ever setting foot in your vehicle. So some of the vehicles that you might see in a place like this are these uh, large hybrid wing body aircraft that are really good for you know, carrying lots and lots of people or freight. In these uh, case in point here in the middle, the X-57, which uh, exhibits distributed electric propulsion, which was talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, quiet supersonic technology from you know, very fast flights over long distances. So the point is that at these transportation nexus, it's you know, part of the high-speed rail, on-demand mobility, supersonic, subsonic flight, and goods distribution, but it's all interconnected. It's just an extension of that infrastructure that already exists. 
So let's take a look at what the airspace system might look like. And this is just in 2035, bear in mind. This is 32,000 point-to-point travel routes, and these are only the ones that are shown to have more than three trips per day. So it's only about a quarter of the total predicted for this time frame. This doesn't include commercial flights. This doesn't include material and goods distributions. This is just personal point-to-point travel. A network like this is incredibly complex, and in order to maintain the safety of the network and the efficiency of the network, it almost necessitates having advanced computing or artificial intelligence with human oversight. Humans are really, really good at pattern recognition. So if we see a problem that's wrong, we can go in and fix it, but we get lost in the details when we try and maintain this thing and micromanage down at the ground level. So for on-demand mobility, what do some of these vehicles look like? On the left, we have some concepts for a thin hull and a hypercommuter. And then Joby Aviation was kind enough to offer us an animation of their vertical takeoff and landing S2 vehicle. Uh, you can see that it opens up the props, it takes off vertically, and then transitions to forward flight. This is just a concept right now, but this is kind of what it could look like. Now bear in mind, again, that these vehicles aren't necessarily just for urban commuting going point A to point B. By being able to bring ready access to flight all over the world with electric flight and power availability, natural barriers don't pose such a hindrance to people traveling anymore. So things like rivers and mountains, jungles and tundra, you can just go over those things instead of having to have a big hulking vehicle carry you across the ground. So you can live almost anywhere and still have access to resources and the things that you need for necessities. So if we move even farther out, if we have this larger net because we're able to travel farther and faster, we can live farther and farther away from our place of work or our place of business, or you can put a manufacturing facility somewhere out in the open to where loads of people can get to it. So with faster and fewer commutes, you get this better work-life balance. You can spend more time at home. And if you can move farther and farther out from these cities, you can have a higher demand for housing in areas that were possibly or previously dependent on uh, mining or local manufacturing that maybe didn't do so well through the economy. So by driving these markets back up, you start getting more property taxes. You get money for infrastructure. You get money for education in your local economy. Small businesses can come on the rise again. You know, these are things that everybody's excited about, and it opens up lots and lots of opportunities for this. So moving even farther out, you know, things like offshore energy farms in the way of solar or wind or wave energy. You know, are these things large enough to support, you know, communities and uh, possibly uh, seabed communities and outposts and things like that? Do they operate as little vacation stopovers? If you want to take a personal supersonic vehicle to Europe, for example, and stop off, rest, refuel, and then carry on your way, that may be a possibility. And then, you know, it may be such that these little small communities pop up in the, in the neighborhood to support these things. And maybe you like the idea of living out on the ocean constantly and being able to look up to the smell of the sea and everything else. You know, it's, it's not a bad idea. So maybe retirement communities out here or even farms. So looking at the supersonic travel landscape for the future, by having higher energy density storage and increased energy availability, and more importantly, a low sonic boom footprint, we're able to bring more affordable, powerful applications to individual users to the point to where supersonic flight becomes readily available across land. So supersonic is still the norm for short-term flights. You don't take a supersonic vehicle down to the grocery store. It just doesn't make any sense. But taking an afternoon or a weekend trip to Hawaii instead of doing something over a week would make perfect sense. You know, it kind of connects anything even more than it already is. So kind of the future landscape of supersonic and hypersonic flight, you have this rapid international travel. Most flights right now operate at about 500 knots right in the transonic region because that's where the cost performance curve has a sweet spot. You go as fast as it's affordable to do so. Back in the 1930s when the Douglas DC-3 was pretty much everywhere, you could only do about 200 knots. Again, you can only go so fast until it gets too expensive. When we have this energy available to us and it's more affordable to go faster, there's no reason not to do that. And then if we look at hypersonic vehicles, things faster than Mach 6, Mach 7, we start looking at things like space launch assist vehicles and very rapid transportation at high altitudes for things like dignitaries or emergency travel. So let's go a little bit farther away from home. If we have an area or an outpost or a colony on something that has a thin atmosphere, then it's completely reasonable to use things like small drones or vehicles for research, uh, resource acquisition and identification, or delivery of emergency food and water and air and medical supplies to places, or even search and rescue. 
So if we move a little bit farther out even more, we've got commercial space transportation and what does that look like in the future? If we have outposts and colonies and people on these other bodies, we're gonna need a way to get new people there, bring people back, give goods and food and water and materials and resources to these places because it may not be possible to gather them at the site. So do we have this cyclic operation of vehicles to where it's hourly trips to low Earth orbit or the moon and daily trips to Mars? Do we have weekly trips out to the Jovian moons? And if Hawaii and Asia and Australia are so close at home to where you can get there in an afternoon, do we start building up a cruise industry of these variable gravity population ships to where you send thousands of people and you can have a nice low gravity closer to the center and then have Earth gravity out at the side? Spend a month traveling through space, go dip through Saturn's rings and come on home. Doesn't sound too bad and it's a pretty exciting landscape for the future of space travel. So a look at some of the emerging technologies that we have. Distributed propulsion is already on the rise. It makes for very efficient cruise operation. We've got fuel and energy research under Project Fuel Leap where we take aviation fuel and convert it to electrical power through solid oxide fuel cells. And then things like 3D printing. We're already printing structures and doing carbon fiber layup and wood and metal pseudoplastics where you maintain some of those materials. You know, synthetic vision to help pilots see through terrible weather or the rise of autonomy and AI to help correct for gusts and, you know, terrible flight conditions. And again, you know, the thin atmosphere transportation systems with things like uh, the Ares and the Mars Reusable Flyer, these are demonstrated concepts to where you can operate in these thin atmospheres and these do work. So what is NASA's role in the future? You know, to me, it's our job to inspire people, to educate and to innovate. But we are a publicly funded institution. That means it's our job to be justifiably daring. We have to be responsible to the taxpayers, but bold enough to go after the new technologies and the new discoveries and the things that really make this system tick. So looking at things like hypersonic vehicles and traveling farther and faster, advanced materials to making it possible to build these vehicles, maintaining our standards of safety and reliability as always, and things like interstellar exploration, you know, how far are we willing to look for a new home? And extraterrestrial transportation, when we have everything in our local neighborhood locked down, how do we make those outposts and those colonies prosperous? How do we make it grow? How do we build our economy in space? So all of these things make it a very exciting landscape for transportation in the future. And hopefully, you know, I'll get to be a part of that. So thank you all very much. And now I'm going to hand off to Dale Arney to talk about the future of exploration. Hello everyone, my name is Dale Arney. I uh, apologize for my voice. <clears throat> I'm getting over something. But um, I'm going to talk to you today about the future of space exploration uh, and what it could look like in 100 years. So but before we can really pontificate on uh, what the future is going to be like in 100 years, what we're going to be doing, we really need to understand why we're going to be in space in the first place. Because why we're there is going to dictate what we do and how we do it. And so what I show here are six uh, potential motivations for going into space. The first is colonization. Um, so moving people off of the, off the planet Earth uh, permanently so people will live their entire lives in, uh, in space, not, not ever coming back to Earth. Uh, commerce, uh, expanding the economic sphere of influence beyond uh, the surface of the Earth. Scientific discovery, answering the questions like what's out there, where do we come from, are we alone? Uh, resource acquisition, uh, both for uh, supporting the growing population on, and energy needs on Earth, as well as to support this uh, expanding human presence into the solar system. Uh, survival of humanity, there are lots of existential threats to the human race, both within and outside of our control, uh, and so we really need to back up the hard drive if we want to continue to exist as a species. Uh, I always say the dinosaurs were a single planet species and look what happened to them. And then finally, I end up with, I want to end with prestige and inspiration. And this is kind of where it really started with Apollo when we were trying to compete with the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, still today, that's kind of our driving motivation uh, for human space exploration. But what I want to show you today is a, a vision of the future that looks at some of these other motivations where what they, if they exist, what could the, the future look like? So I want to look at uh, kind of our current situation first to give you an idea of where we are now. Uh, we have the International Space Station up in orbit. Uh, we've used it for uh, long-duration human space flight, our understanding of that 
um, international cooperation with our partners, and then also microgravity science and, and limited manufacturing. And so our current population as of this week in space is three. And so you're going you're gonna to see when I look 100 years in the future uh, how that's going to grow significantly. We're also seeing an evolution from government-only space operations into more commercial and public-private partnership uh, type of operations. Uh, so the, the primary example is the commercial crew and cargo uh, deliveries to International Space Station. But then you're also seeing a lot of interest in uh, things like space tourism that are, that are coming out today, uh, coming out nowadays. Uh, from the technological standpoint, uh, you see a real emphasis on reusability. Now, NASA has been looking at reusability for, for launch vehicles uh, for decades. The shuttle was a partially reusable launch vehicle. But now you're starting to see that move out into the commercial sector. Uh, SpaceX just relaunched a used Falcon 9 um, core stage. And then uh, Blue Origin has uh, flown their suborbital vehicle, New Shepard, five times now. And so you're starting to see this, uh, this transition to reusability go into the commercial sector to try and reduce costs. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, as electronics have improved, we're able to start building smaller and smaller satellites that have very similar capabilities to those big satellites we used to have. Uh, and so that's driven down the, the need for large launch vehicles. So we're looking at smaller launch vehicles launching more regularly. And with the economies of scale, uh, you're starting to see the cost of access to space uh, decline. And so that's kind of you know, the, the, the where we are. We're on the cusp of, of uh, exploding into uh, massive space exploration and the potential of that. So now I want to jump ahead and look at 100 years from now. And I want to look kind of starting close to Earth and then expanding outward from there. <clears throat> so close to Earth, we're going to be doing a lot of the same stuff we're doing now, just more of it. So from Earth observation standpoint, we'll still be doing the Earth science and imagery. Um, but we'll also have real-time surveillance of the, of the entire planet. So uh, that'll have ec economic impacts. You can, have constantly, uh, you can constantly look at your crops, at new developments, at traffic, you know, get real-time updates on all of that from space. Uh, from a military standpoint, having real-time situational awareness of any battlefield uh, will be useful. And then disaster detection and relief. So, um, you, know, you know, forest fires or floods or something like that, being able to detect those immediately and, and respond accordingly. Uh, the next thing is logistics and propellant. Uh, so in order, if we have a lot of people in space, we'll need to support them with food and supplies and, and, and those types of things. So that's where the logistics come into play. And then the propellant, in order to move us around in space, if we're going further out uh, into the solar system, it takes a lot of propellant to get out of the Earth's gravity well. And, and so that'll be a, a, a big commodity in space. Uh, hotels and condos, a lot of people are thinking over the next 50 to 100 years, we'll have thousands of people living in space. So compare that to the three we have now. And so we'll need a place for those, uh, those people to stay. And so you're talking about uh, big, large-scale um, hotels or, or condos. And um, you could even imagine uh, something like a, a retirement community of people uh, you know, are, are, have limited mobility. They can go up and live in, in low or microgravity and just kind of float around. Um, <coughs> so it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there's a market for that. Um, <laughs> And then also uh, in-space manufacturing and construction. So if you want to build something uh, like the picture that I show here uh, that, that houses these thousands of people and supports that local economy, uh, we're going to have to quit uh, trying to launch everything pre-integrated on the ground, and we're going to have to start building stuff in space. Um, and then finally, power generation. Uh, Large-scale power generation to support the, the infrastructure that's in space, but there's also the potential to beam it back down to Earth and use it to augment some of the terrestrial generated power as well. Uh, moving further out to the lunar vicinity, now this includes both the surface and in orbits around, uh, around the moon, either big circular orbits or at the stable Lagrange points on, on either side. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities at the moon. Uh, there's, first of all, scientific discovery. The, the lunar surface has been pretty much untouched for millions of years, so we can go and explore and see what the, you know, the, the evolution of the solar system has been like and, and how it was formed and, and, and has uh, changed. We can also do deep space exploration without the interference from Earth. If you're on the, the far side of the moon, you can, you can look out uh, into the solar system uh, without having to worry about all the interference from Earth. Uh, from a commerce standpoint, there's a lot of companies that are looking into uh, mining, uh, mining on the moon. Uh, there's, there's water there. You can generate propellant. 
There's also helium-3 if we ever get to the point where uh, we have fusion energy. Uh, that's a possibility. And then tourism is, a, is another uh, possibility for the moon because uh, SpaceX has claimed that they already have paying customers to be, to be sent around the moon, so that's, uh, that's the possibility. Uh, but, but one of the most uh, you know, useful aspects uh, of the lunar vicinity is if you, if you can get in these big orbits or at the Lagrange points, you're most of the way out of the Earth's gravity well. Uh, so you could aggregate things there, and then it was just a little kick to get you out into the deeper into the solar system. And so speaking of the solar system, uh, let's talk about a couple of destinations you could potentially go to um, out there. The first is Mars. Mars is likely the most hospitable planet to humans uh, in our solar system after Earth. It's got a lot of resources. It's got water. The atmosphere is carbon dioxide and nitrogen. And with that, you can generate uh, propellant to get on and off the planet and to move around. You can uh, create water to drink, air to breathe. You can even create plastics to make spare parts or, or any, anything else you want to um, use there. Uh, some of the challenges of the moon, or sorry, Mars, the, the low atmospheric pressure and the uh, low gravity that, uh, that exists there, as well as the radiation exposure that, uh, that you get uh, while you're at Mars. And so if people live there for long durations, you know, maybe their whole life if they're born and, and grow up there, you know, could they ever come back to the Earth uh, or would their physiology be such that they, they are you know, destined to live their life in Mars? Another destination is asteroids. Asteroids have millions of tons of resources and a very small gravity well, so it's very easy to get those resources off of the, off of the asteroids and, and use them in, the, uh, in space. Um, they could be used uh, in space to build spacecraft or, or, or any other type of structure you want, but we could also bring things back down to Earth and use it uh, on Earth as, as the resources start to um, get used up. Uh, some of the challenges for asteroids are detecting and characterizing these things are very difficult. They're small, they're dark, and they're on a black backdrop, so it's kind of hard to, to figure out what we're looking at. Uh, and then they're also difficult to access on a regular basis, uh, which is why a lot of people talk about grabbing asteroids and bringing them back to Earth so that we can have constant access to them, uh, whereas where in their natural orbits they're difficult to get to. Next up is Venus. So Venus provides the most Earth-like environment in the solar system, uh, but at 50 kilometers. So it's more like Cloud City in Star Wars, whereas Mars is more like Tatooine. So um, there's lots of solar energy there. The gravity is very similar to Earth, and the atmospheric pressure is very similar to Earth. Uh, and so uh, you know, the, the physiological effects are, are reduced. Uh, and breathable air actually floats in the dense atmosphere, so you could inflate these... Uh, these airship-like vehicles, and the, the airbag is actually livable volume that people can, can walk around and live in. Uh, the, biggest, the big challenges for Venus, uh, there are uh, there's sulfuric acid in the atmosphere that you've got to deal with, and you have very little access to the surface. Uh, so you, you have uh, very limited access to like heavier metals or, or, or um, water or anything like that. Uh, the, Next stop will be the gas giant moons. The, uh, the, the moons around the gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn are, are pretty intriguing and they have a lot of unknown opportunities uh, for us to utilize and explore. Um, Europa is uh, basically an ice planet with a liquid water ocean underneath uh, and so the, the opportunities for using that water for anything is, is um, pretty, pretty enticing. Uh, you know, are there alien fish down there? We can go ice fishing and, and uh, eat them. Uh, Titan, another moon, um, has methane lakes, and methane is one of our rocket propellants that we use. So you could literally just go hook up a hose to the lake and fill up your, your launch vehicle and, and move around uh, all you want. The challenges here are the distance and the time that it takes to get there. So we'll need a more advanced propulsion system, and we'll need uh, to keep the humans alive on the trip out there and back in, in that zero-G environment. There's also very little sunlight, so you have to... Um, generate your energy some other way than, than solar, pa solar panels or anything like that. You'd have to uh, go to nuclear or something along those lines. And then finally, um, interstellar. So the, the goal with interstellar space travel would be to find a planet that can support human life without all these engineering challenges that I've been talking about the whole time in, the, in our current solar system. Uh, so 100 years from now, the people like me who are working on things like Mars exploration uh, we'll likely be working on interstellar exploration for humans. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of uh, maybe exoplanet scouting, either 
big telescopes that we've built in space uh, around Earth or, or, or in our solar system to, to look at these uh, exoplanets or tiny little microprobes that we send out uh, really fast so that they can uh, go out there and then report back what they're finding. We'll also be working on interstellar human spacecraft. The times to get to these dis destinations are such that you would have to start looking at things like multi-generational spacecraft or uh, advanced technologies like cryogenics and stuff like that to, uh, uh, to get out there with, uh, with a crew. And then also advanced propulsion. This is where things like nuclear electric and nuclear thermal uh, have good applications. But then also uh, some of these physics breakthrough that, that JF was talking about. Uh, Johnson Space Center is working on uh, like an EM drive, which is a propellantless um, space travel. And so these type of physics breakthroughs would be applicable in, in missions like this that, that may actually make them feasible. So, so maybe coming back down to Earth a little bit, uh, let's look at today what the emerging technologies that, that uh, you can read about today and, uh, and kind of see where we are and where we're going. Uh, first of all, smaller and cheaper. So the, the CubeSats making smaller, um, smaller satellites that have a lot of capability uh, and then cheaper access to space due to the economies of scale and everything. Uh, space economy primarily centered around resources and people, uh, so propellants and uh, you know, hard materials to build things out of. And uh, you know, I have space tourism on here, but when you're, when you're in the colonization stage, you're also shipping out colonists. Uh, autonomy, uh, this will reduce the operations costs of these, uh, these types of missions in the future. And it will allow the humans to actually do the fun, interesting, exciting things and let the robots do the dangerous or mundane things. And so we get a lot more out of our, out of our exploration. And then finally, working on enabling longer trips. And this is longer in both duration and in distance. So if the, the distance part, you need better propulsion systems in order to get there. And so we're working you know, electric propulsion and, and these advanced concepts like the EM drive that I talked about. And then the duration part where you have to make sure that the humans can survive longer in space and, um, and actually arrive at their destination alive. And so I want to close here with the the ultimate goal of exploration, even after 2117, is really to make it permanent. Because civilizations tend to come and go, and if we want to survive as a species, one day we will have to leave the cradle. Thank you. And I will turn it over to Hillary now to talk about NASA in the 22nd century. Well, hello, my name is Hillary Blakely and I'm an aerospace engineer at uh, NASA Langley. And today I have the privilege of trying to put some of these incredible technologies we've talked about today into a fuller embodied story of what this could actually look like as our future. And to do that, I'm gonna walk you through actually the results of a brainstorming session that NASA held last year in November. Um, participants were NASA employees from centers all across the country, every single center was represented, and they worked through a series of time frames from NASA as an agency's 100th anniversary, 125th, and 150th anniversaries to try to see all that NASA really could be in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, they worked through a series of scenarios and assumptions at each of these timelines and primarily answered five different questions, both technical and more societal geared, to get this full-bodied image of our future. So these five questions were synthesized on this slide and we looked at things such as airplanes and air transportation systems, um, space habitats and deep space exploration vehicles. What did all of these look like? And really, where are we taking them? which raised the question of what kind of new science are we looking to explore in our future. We combined those answers with the questions such as what types of new hiring processes and procedures will NASA have to use to really get us to this future that we want to see? And what government organization and budget structure will be needed in the future if all these technologies are really going to come to pass? So we took all of the answers and were able to actually create a um, graphic of the image of what we want to see for our future. We've been calling it kind of this dreamer's reality. So this graphic is packed with so many hidden features, but it is designed to be read from the bottom left to the top right in expanding circles of time frames. So you see 2058 at NASA's 100th anniversary. And by the way, I know that it's Langley's 100th anniversary this year. I'm talking about NASA as an agency. 
Um, moving on to 2083 at its 125th, and finally ending in the 22nd century in 2108. So I want to take you through each of these time frames and kind of highlight the various images that came up for the brainstormers as we went through. And I'm going to focus on actually telling a story of the three Earths, one in each time frame, as kind of a representation of humanity's focus for where we're looking. So let's start our journey in 2058 and see what we came up with. Here you see this very concrete and well-known Earth. It is definitely still our main source of life and our main location of living. Um, we're still focused very much on traveling around the Earth and getting around it. So you see that various air transportation systems have come up, and you actually see a highlighted increase in variety of the design, shape, and power of these, suggesting possibly that each aircraft is used for a different purpose. Possibly, for example, getting us into low Earth orbit, as you see the space station being pictured very close to Earth. As was mentioned before, this could radically change everything we think we know about tourism. Can you imagine what on-demand ride sharing or quick access to low Earth orbit or the moon looks like for an ad popping up for your next vacation? I mean, sign me up, I'm going, definitely. But that's, it's crazy to think about and really fun. We also have had this theme of automation in the future. Well, our world of 2058 apparently uses automation to effectively enable the service industry, inventively managing things such as resourcing, deliveries, um, trash, and recycling. So as we think about where all these new technologies have evolved, we also have to think about where we as humanity are living. In 2058, apparently, we've started to colonize Mars, and we're both utilizing above-ground, inflatable dome-like structures, and also underground colonies for radiation protection. As technologies as we advance in 2058 have literally opened up whole new worlds for us, we have to start to think about what does actually life and society look like as life outside of Earth becomes slowly distant from our life on our home planet? So let's take our first time leap and jump to 2083. You see this Earth in the lower left corner as slightly more transparent, maybe a little bit faded as the one that was known in 2058. Does this suggest possibly that we're not solely focused on Earth and its preservation, but maybe really looking to explore new life planets? You see that the air transportation here has become increasingly personal and customizable, definitely opening up those options of hypersonic speeds. And as our airplanes have sped up, the distance between locations seems to have grown smaller. A trip from here to Europe would become today's equivalent of a trip from Newport News to DC. You can see in this image, well, you can kind of see in this image, um, Paris's Eiffel Tower, right next to London's Eye, right next to Seattle's Space Needle, um, suggesting that these national landmarks have truly just become right next door. What does this mean for humanity as our customs and cultures move closer and closer together and become more blended? We also have to take a look at where we're living in 2083. So we've definitely colonized Mars at this point, and we've also moved on to create deep space habitats, possibly at our Lagrange points. On the surface of Mars, you see that we've utilized mobile greenhouses and actually even implemented a railway system to try to get around the planet. Well, when we talk about the deep space vehicles, I don't know about you, but for me, I feel like I would have trouble living there full time. I would miss the feel of you know, sun on my face or seeing the green of Earth. So you see, to kind of mitigate these issues of space travel, various windows having been installed on our space vehicles and habitats. One shows the wonders of deep space that are right outside the window, and the other shows a peaceful Earth beach scene. So virtual reality at this point has really been perfected to enable this long duration space habitats. We also have to think about what happens when you go outside? You know, how do you actually play catch with your kids? We have to adjust to a way of life that involves putting on our space protection, our radiation protection, in the same way today we would put on our pants to go out the front door. These life and this society, as we move on to these new planets and new version of life, becomes increasingly different from life on our home planet. Let's continue toying with this idea of what is life and what is living outside of our home planet of Earth as we make our final stop in the 22nd century. We are now in the year 2108, and you see that Earth is really quite faded, almost looking hollow. This suggests maybe humanity's focus really no longer uses Earth as our main source of life. We've pushed on and explored and found new things, and that's what we're focused on here. 
Again, this is not definitely going to happen, but it's a possibility of where we could see ourselves in the future. As humanity, as we've started to slowly understand our risks and uncertainties of our systems, we've started to really try to manage our vulnerabilities. With that in mind, housing for in-space assembly has become more utilizing emergency situations and seeing these self-sustaining bubbles as our space habitat communities. We have to think of ourselves, you know, what does this, again, mean for life, living, what do our homes become? And you can really see, though, no matter how clever of a brainstormer you can get to sit down and think about this, our future in 2108 primarily remains really unclear. And this is kind of seen by that fading outline of the year. As a technology rapidly advances through society, the clarity of our future has to slow down. We have to stop and think to ourselves, what, have all, what do all of these advancements actually mean? What new ethical issues may have arisen as our culture and societal norms have morphed, as we become both more reachable and accessible than ever, and yet more physically distant than we've ever been? We have to think about, you know, how are we governing ourselves? How are we communicating? Right now we have worldwide news. What happens when that becomes planetary system-wide and your local news becomes Earth's news? It's a totally different way of thinking about it and a totally different way of getting your day-to-day -day life going on. And this kind of highlights that theme that came up for each brainstormer as we went along, that theme of the different life cycle of space. So as I draw this graphic illustration to a close, I want to highlight this life cycle. Our brainstormers suggested that we are definitely going to be creating new life in space. What does that mean? Will new life and living completely in space mean that we can't possibly ever come back to Earth? Will life in space change our bodies in ways we could have never predicted? How do we raise children? You know, as a generative society, education of the young has always been important. But what are we teaching our children? I'd imagine teaching basic things of how to grow up on Earth are vastly different from how to grow up on Mars. Even things like my eighth grade Earth science class takes on a whole new meaning. We have to think about these new life cycles. And as we learn and explore and grow more, we may come across other intelligent life. Now, thankfully, this brainstorming session took an optimistic view of this interaction and said that we would become friends with these other beings. Can you imagine what those relationships and communication looks like? And as we consider new life in space, we also have to consider new death in space and what customs around death have stayed the same versus what have changed. But thankfully, it's not represented in this graphic as a quiet and sad death, but as really a celebration, a celebration of life and mankind and all that we have accomplished. We realize that it is not just these amazing technologies that are coming out and being new every single day, but it is about society. It is about humanity. And it is up to us to really decide and question what our role in this future is going to be, what this dreamer's reality will look like what actions we as humanity and as NASA can take today to best create this beautiful, wonderful future vision that we want to see for tomorrow. So with that, I will hand it back over to Jaya for our closing comments. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So if after uh, this presentation you have a number of ideas and thoughts and images that don't quite fit together, there is a reason for that, it's because it's ahead. And we have, we couldn't guarantee you anything, but as you saw, what we did is we actually brought in a number of people and together and had them think about what this future would look like from different perspective. And so what I'm going to do to wrap it all up is I'm gonna play actually a video of uh, extracts from uh, these two workshops we ran earlier in the year. And, and for those of you who know NASA, there are a couple surprises in the, in the workshop, people that, you, that we identified there, but that uh, uh, have left NASA a while ago. They're identified by their current profession, but they played a major role in the agency. So you'll be pleasantly surprised, I'm sure. So with that. Where are we going to be in 100 years? Human avatars for deep space travel. I'm looking for vignettes. Creating extraterrestrials. I'm looking for parts of the story. He has to be radiation hard, and they've already assessed him for that, or they're going to genetically engineer him so that he can withstand radiation. 
I'm looking for, you know, what, what are some of the things we think could be happening in a hundred years? The robots will take advantage of the humans. The heart of the process is around brainstorming. A hundred years is a long time, and it's incumbent on all of us to help NASA with vignettes around exciting narratives for the future. We will know that we are doing our job correctly if wild ideas come up. Let, let the games begin. Government and governance. Exploration. Virtual reality. Defense. Work and jobs. The future of transportation. This instant now, this everything we need, which is going to grow in the future, that'll expand from aircraft to drones to your front door. That's aerospace. That's bringing the world community together. We see more laws and, and methods of governing uh, the uses of resources. If there's just not enough for everyone, you have to figure out how to divvy it up. There is a resource starvation on Earth that we will try to address with mining and exploitation abroad. An accelerated shift technology impacting a variety of industry sectors at the same time. Now the conversation changes, we think, globally and maybe all of our roles in it and the opportunities, the opportunities actually for collaboration or, or dissent. If the current trends continue, we'll see a rise in the sea levels. I'm imagining that we will have seaports, uh, giant planes coming in and landing in, in the waters and from there you will take your uh, private quadricopter uh, that might be mostly robotic actually, and, and travel to your island home. There'll be these autonomous, uh, multi-rotor electric vehicles uh, that uh, you'll be able to call up on your device, whatever that may be, wherever it may be implanted in your brain, uh, and summon it to your place and it'll transport you from point A to B. A hundred years from now, and not only will cargo be moving around, but people will be moving around in an autonomous fashion, and there'll be more point to point. Um, you know, think of the, the two-dimensional transportation structure we have on the ground for the masses that's individualized, if you will, and go up a dimension into space and you'll have something uh, very complex. For sure, we're going to be on Mars by then with humans. Um, I, I think on the way, we probably will have done, uh, started a limited lunar program. The commercial guys are going to come on with significantly lower costs to orbit and that's going to be enabling of our exploration dreams. This ChemSEP hybrid vehicle, which uh, basically you do a chemical burn to get going fast early. Going to the moon and Mars and, and maybe the you know asteroids, maybe the moons of Jupiter in a hundred years. Uh, what we're going to be using are uh, nuclear propulsion. Those concepts were first tested 40 and 50 years ago. We just haven't put them into play in working systems. And I think over the next hundred years, we really will. I believe that NASA's mission here for the next hundred years is really about human purpose, right? And human purpose to me is a positive thing. Our spirit is to explore, our spirit is to evolve, to learn, right? And to uh, foster our um, uh, proliferation and prosperity as a species. Human body doesn't really like a truly extended exposure to zero G. Human body doesn't like heavy ion radiation. To me, both the solution for both those things lies in DNA modification and repair techniques. Exploration could be done by, through virtual presence, um, uh, telepresence, uh, virtual realities or augmented realities, where you don't necessarily have to send a person, or at least you don't send a person until you know what you're getting into. Robotics could actually be a mode of transportation in 2117 by enabling people to go to Europa, go to Mars, go to Mount Everest with a robotic avatar. Presumably we'll be more and more global as a society in terms of how information travels. We might be more divided perhaps, but, but in terms of how information unites us, we are we're going to be more global even than today. This is going to be a, a wild, wild new world uh, in, a, in 100 years. Right. I think you've seen this slide a number of times. This is part of, uh, for us, it is part of our 100th anniversary. We have a number of events coming up, and uh, I think you all got a package uh, with, uh, I really invite you to participate. I'm excited to participate in those as well. So with that, you've seen this slide before. Questions?
guys want to comment? There you go. Questions? Oh, we got the first one. Thank you for sh sharing this uh, wonderful and fantastic, incredible journey to the future and endeavor of the human imagination. I have a specific question. Uh, does our educational system will support the manpower you need to realize these dreams? So somebody just uh, sent, a, uh, sent me a video this morning of, uh, of actually a high school somewhere, I think it was in Louisiana. And uh, it was ex ex incredibly exciting. You had a number of kids in this incredibly creative space who had access to uh, you know, some of the modern techniques for uh, 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 advanced manufacturing and computerized and, and, and uh, people interaction. And they were, um, they were collaborating very intensely. They were solving real life problems and they were incredibly creative. So to a large extent, I see things that I find exciting. Now, have we solved all the problems we have to solve? Probably not, but there are some very solid routes to start from. I'm excited. As a public school teacher for 39 years, mm -hmm. I disagree Okay. <laughs> very strongly because I think our public our education system is not producing, the families are not producing the kids with the idea, learn as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Our entire school system in the United States mm -hmm. does not do that. Mm -hmm. My wife agrees with me. She taught at Ferguson, I taught at Warwick, at Tab, and mm -hmm. out in York County. And we see Chinese families come to this country, families from India, their kids go. Yes, they can um, learn math and things, but that's not where the focus is on the education. It's sports. So, so I appreciate your, your, your input, and obviously having done it for 40 years, you know quite a bit more than, I, I, what I want to share is that I've seen some really exciting things also, and I think we can collectively, you know, build on that. I don't know if any one of you that, guys. That's will. wonderful, and uh, I will elaborate with a story, small story. My high school friend mm -hmm. graduated in aerospace engineering, mm -hmm. and I asked him, would you then uh, pursue this career? And he said, no, I'll go to Wall Street because I can make 10 times more. So as a society also, as a society also, do we support this in our future endeavors? Mm -hmm. It's a small story. Mm -hmm. It's a good story, though. It's a real one. My understanding is, is you know, the 11 billion population that the world's getting to, and I, I could not, you know, I'm, I'm thinking we're what, five, six, seven, somewhere in there now. Most of that explosion is going to be in places like Africa, places like the poor areas of India and Asia. Are we just sort of, I don't want to say turning our back, but is a significant portion of the world population just sort of going to be disregarded or left behind or if you know, you understand what I'm trying to say. I don't, you know, I just don't see how I'm sort of in the, you know, with these guys with the education, but I just don't see how we can get everybody on earth ready to do all that, you know, and, and there are, you know, things like money and do we blow ourselves up before we get there, you know. Uh. Yeah. No, I mean, to that point, um, the idea that we try and build up our renewable resource infrastructure and things like that. There are a lot of open spaces where energy acquisition like that makes a lot of sense. Africa is one of those places and there's already a rising trend of trying to build the ener energy infrastructure in places like that. But as I mentioned in the transportation slides, if we make these aerial vehicles much more accessible to places like that to where it's a very difficult landscape to operate in on the ground. If you're able to start moving people back and forth out of these dangerous areas to where you can get access to resources and start building up infrastructure in a much more integrated and, and 
you know, doable fashion, then it's just, do we as a society, society support that? And uh, if everyone agrees that that's something that's important, then yes, I think that's something we can do. Unlike fossil fuels, is uh, nuclear energy infinite? I mean, will we always have that? Do we have, to, it's a renewable s source? I mean, it, when we're out in space, we're not gonna have the solar energy, so I'm just curious about the energy we'll be using. Yeah, so I, I think uh, nuclear could be considered a renewable energy. Uh, people will create the products to make uh, the nuclear reactors and stuff, but uh, from, a, from a waste standpoint and all that kind of stuff, it still generates waste and, and you have to deal with it. That's why a lot of people are moving towards kind of the like solar and wind and, and those types of energy sources because they're not only renewable, they'll always be there, but they're also, you know, don't generate any waste. It's just directly to electricity. And, and uh, our solar energy is available to us in space, right? So, so we, we, we can at least take advantage of that. Now, occasionally we bring some nuclear reactors up there to power some of our rover, rovers, but we do, we do reuse uh, nuclear, uh, no, solar energy in space. Okay, I would like to go back to the aerial vehicles. First of all, I would be horrified to have all these cowboys that are on the road now up in the air. <laughs> Secondly, uh, I think a whole group of population would be left out of all these advances. People that are in the low income bracket. Now, when you go to these aerial vehicles, they're sitting on the ground. How do they get from their home to work? When they don't make any provisions for, for people that can't afford these high tech transportation you know in, in response to that it's in a hundred years we at least hope that some of the infrastructure is in place in such a way that it's more affordable to have these vehicles operating for everyone uh, that whole concept of on-demand mobility instead of personally buying one of these vehicles it's kind of like just calling a cab so you order the vehicle to come down to you, you use it for whatever distance you need, and then that's either credited to your account or you use it for what you need it for. And that's not to say that that's the only means of transportation. You know, we expect that there will also be integrated ground transportation networks as well. So, you know, it's, we're trying to bear in mind that we don't leave anybody behind when it comes to things like that. And to the point of, you know, people riding around and hot riding up, up in the, the airspace with, <laughs> with their own vehicles and stuff, you know, hopefully, again, you know, in, in the densely packed areas, traffic is restricted to such a way that it's either solely autonomous flight or controlled flight in those traffic lanes, and then, you know, maybe they let you cut loose when it's out in the open or something like that, or, uh, or what have you. But hopefully, you know, that's something that they address. Heather, I'd like you to start with this question, <clears throat> and this has to do with the uh, physiology of what human beings will be like a hundred years plus from now. And let me, let me start this out by uh, saying that we all know about Darwin and the theory of the fittest and that people are evolving and so what you have on Galapagos is different than other places. And we also know that uh, the segregation of work, we know that there is a queen bee and there are drones that are worker bees. And my question is this, uh, what do you envision the physiology to be a hundred years from now? And will we have a, uh, a matriarchal society <laughs> where only a few men are needed to... Uh, yes. To... Uh, to no. uh, <laughs> let, me, let me finish. Only a few men are required because they can fertilize, but you need to have, but you need to have a woman for each baby because we haven't done this. And then if that's the case, where will society be a hundred years from now? And will these gentlemen, and I noticed that all the people at this seminar were worker bees. <laughs> Would you like to address that whole subject? I have subject? no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I'm 
I'm, st I'm still, you lost me on the fertilization part, maybe a couple bits before. No, um, well, the human body in 100 years. Well, I know this was touched on in the question and answer session last time, and his name is escaping me, who answered, Matt, Matt, yes, had an, a number of incredible answers about you know how low gravity and microgravity really impacts the body, and actually we talked a lot about that kind of genetic modification versus you know what types of exoskeletons might we need to really push society into these deep space and living on on new planets. So I think that there are so many options to really be explored when it comes to actually the human body. And, and it's neat that we're actually diving into some of those things today that will help create what we see as humans tomorrow. You know, we could look crazy different, you know. Maybe, you know, hey, with, with the floating around in space thing, who knows? Um, but as to your matriarch, the, the society question, uh, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass <laughs> on that one. We could talk a little bit later afterwards, but I prefer not to answer online. <laughs> It, it, if, it's, if it makes any difference, I think there was actually an answer to a question last time where uh, the, the class, the, the, the upcoming class of astronauts is, is getting to a point that it's kind of more balanced, closer to 50-50, uh, you know, uh, male and female. So that, I think it's an exciting balance. I think it's going to help us do a better job. Pardon? Hi, I'm a retired um, educator of 34 plus years in public school, and I really do think we have a lot of fantastic schools in our country. Uh, my niece is the principal of a charter school in San Diego, and they're doing fantastic things, uh, having engineers come into the classroom and work with the kids. And I was in a school uh, a week ago in Charlottesville where the fifth graders were learning programming. And in Hampton, city schools where I retired from, and also Precocin schools, I know in Hampton, the superintendent has a new grant from the Ford Foundation, and all the school, high schools are becoming academies <laughs> to interest uh, students in career fields. The other thing I want to say is um, NASA plays a big part in education. As a school principal for 20, administrator for 21 years, I never called upon NASA when they didn't come and help us. And, uh, and they're doing that to schools all over the country. I worked for a contractor at NASA for two years and uh, was head of the Teacher uh, Resource Center. And they're just, they have so many things to help us and so, so many other companies do too. And I really do believe in the future of public education and people are doing fantastic things. It's not easy, but um, I've seen some extremely smart kids and they're gonna be great at planning the future of next 100 years for NASA. So if I can add something to that, we're about to get to the end of May, early June, and at Langley, for me, it's one of the most exciting times because we, uh, we get an influx of 250 to 350 students. They come, they, they are from, you know, finishing high school, uh, they are early in college, and uh, they form into teams, they do fantastic work, they move us along, and I'm always impressed by, by, by what we learn. So I don't want to, do, to dismiss uh, your very serious concerns, the concern of someone who's done it for 40 years, for which you know, we're all grateful, but I think there are optimistic times. And I'll just tie on to that really quickly. Um, also, because I was that kid that really wanted to go to space camp, and my parents kept sending me to sports camp, and so I understand your concern, um, especially because I wasn't good at sports. Engineer, yay. Um, so, but as to going out, and I think NASA does some incredible outreach events. I've been a part of an organization called Hunch with, uh, let me see, high schoolers united with NASA to create hardware. We love our acronyms at NASA. Um, but it's, it's great, and we actually go out into the public schools around the area. I was actually at TAB um, two years ago, and we have these uh, things that people want. Usually it's actually astronauts up on ISS, that things that they would like that aren't you know, red letter priority for NASA to create, such as um, a couple years ago it was a, a new can crusher that they wanted. And NASA said, okay, well, you know, we don't really need to work on that right now, but we'll give it to someone else. And actually, we have high school students that come in and get these problems and have these design challenges, and they come up with some of the most creative solutions I've ever seen. Granted, if you're working with middle schoolers, oftentimes the solutions really aren't 
feasible and physically possible. But the creativity that I've seen in the public schools in the area, and I grew up in the area as well, I think there's, there's definitely a movement um, towards getting more in, involved in this kind of area. Um, a number of years ago, there was a number of articles out about um, creating an infrastructure uh, for smart vehicles where you would just kind of program it in and then th the car, the infrastructure would take you wherever you wanted to go. Um, with the advent of the self-driving car and the amount of automation that's now occurring in cockpits, is that going to be needed or will what we have now suffice? I I think they, they're kind of synergistic. You have, you have to have the network for the autonomous car to be able to follow. So it has to be able to know where it is in relation to everything else in order to get around. And part of that is knowing where the other cars are and wh what the system needs and how to call the vehicle to a certain place. So uh, it's, it's probably you know, a little bit of both to where the autonomous vehicles are fully aware of their surroundings and things like that and where they need to go and what they need to do, but over longer distances, it's, you know, what is the best route? How can I get to you the fastest or the easiest? Okay, I think our time is up. I hope, I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. I look forward to this one for uh, the whole, the whole month. A couple of things. I, first, I want to thank you all um, and let you know there's not going to be a test. We're at the end of our class, our five lectures. You don't have to go home. There's no study material, but I hope you learned a thing or two and can take that with you. I hope you can come join us at some of our events that we've been talking about now for the last five weeks. Um, I want to thank Chris and the NASA EDGE team. They're the folks that have been videotaping all this, or not videotaping, it's their digital recording yeah, and streaming it. If you go to YouTube and you just search on NASA Edge, you'll see all of these recorded, the five lectures. And they do a lot of other, all the launches and missions that NASA does, they're usually out there with their team and interviewing folks, a lot of really great material on their YouTube NASA page. So go check them out. Uh, thank you to the CNU Lifelong Learning Society. You guys have a great program here. I'm looking forward to retiring <laughs> and hopefully sitting out there and, and hearing some of this. And uh, thanks to all of you for sticking with us and hearing about NASA. Now you know what we do and uh, how we do it. We hope you'll take that out and share it with your friends and family. So thanks again. We we'll hope you'll, we'll see you this summer for our centennial celebrations.